fourth part of the introduction to the life of reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Plato's Myths in Lieu of Physics. What had happened was briefly this. Plato, having studied many sorts of philosophy and being a bold and universal genius, was not satisfied to leave all physical questions pending as his master had done. He adopted accordingly Heraclitus' doctrine of the immediate, which he now called the realm of phenomena. For what exists at any instant, if you arrest and name it, turns out to have been an embodiment of some logical essence, such as discourse might define. In every fact some idea makes its appearance, and such an apparition of the ideal is a phenomenon. Moreover, another philosophy had made a deep impression on Plato's mind, and had helped to develop Socratic definitions. Parmenides had called the concept of pure being the only reality, and to satisfy the strong dialectic by which this doctrine was supported, and at the same time to bridge the infinite chasm between one formless substance and many appearances irrelevant to it. Plato substituted the many Socratic ideas, all of which were relevant to appearance, for the one concept of Parmenides. The ideas thus acquired what is called metaphysical subsistence, for they stood in the place of the Eleatic Absolute, and at the same time were the realities that phenomena manifested. The technique of this combination is much to be admired, but the feat is technical and adds nothing to the significance of what Plato has to say on any concrete subject. This barren triumph was, however, fruitful in misunderstandings. The characters and values a thing possessed were now conceived to subsist apart from it, and might even have preceded it and caused its existence. A mechanism composed of values and definitions could thus be placed behind phenomena to constitute a substantial physical world. Such a dream could not be taken seriously until good sense was wholly lost and a bevy of magic spirits could be imagined peopling the infinite and yet carrying on the business of earth. Aristotle rejected the metaphysical subsistence of ideas, but thought they might still be essences operative in nature, if only they were identified with the life or form of particular things. The dream thus lost its frank wildness, but none of its inherent incongruity, for the sense in which characters and values make a thing what it is, is purely dialectical. They give it its status in the ideal world, but the appearance of these characters and values here and now is what needs explanation in physics, an explanation which can be furnished, of course, only by the physical concatenation and distribution of causes. Side note, Aristotle's final causes. Modern science can avoid such expedients. Aristotle himself did not fail to make this necessary distinction between efficient cause and formal essence. But as his science was only natural history, and mechanism had no plausibility in his eyes, the efficiency of the cause was always due, in his view, to its ideal quality. As in heredity, the father's human character, not his physical structure, might seem to warrant the son's humanity. Every ideal, before it could be embodied, had to pre-exist in some other embodiment, but as when the ultimate purpose of the cosmos is considered, it seems to lie beyond any given embodiment, the highest ideal must somehow exist disembodied. It must pre-exist, thought Aristotle, in order to supply by way of magic attraction, a physical cause for perpetual movement in the world. 
it must be confessed in justice to this consummate philosopher who is not less masterly in the use of knowledge than unhappy in divination that the transformation of the highest good into a physical power is merely incidental with him and due to a want of faith at that time excusable in mechanism and evolution aristotle's deity is always a moral ideal and every detail in his definition is based on discrimination between the better and the worse no accommodation to the ways of nature is here allowed to cloud the kingdom of heaven this deity is not condemned to do whatever happens nor to absorb whatever exists it is mythical only in its physical application in moral philosophy it remains a legitimate conception truth certainly exists if existence be not too mean an attribute for that eternal realm which is tenanted by ideals but truth is repugnant to physical or psychical being moreover truth may very well be identified with an impossible intellect which should do nothing but possess all truth with no point of view no animal warmth and no transitive process such an intellect and truth are expressions having a different metaphorical background and connotation but when thought out an identical import they both attempt to evoke that ideal standard which human thought proposes to itself this function is their effective essence it ensures their eternal fixity and this property surely endows them with a very genuine and sublime reality what is fantastic is only the dynamic function attributed to them by aristotle which obliges them to inhabit some fabulous extension to the physical world even this physical efficacy however is spiritualized as much as possible since deity is said to move the cosmos only as an object of love or an object of knowledge may move the mind such efficacy is imputed to a hypostasized end but evidently resides in fact in the functioning and impulsive spirit that conceives and pursues an ideal and doing it with whatever attraction it may seem to have the absolute intellect described by aristotle remains therefore as pertinent to the life of reason as plato's idea of the good though less comprehensive for it abstracts from all animal interests from all passions and mortality it is more adequate and distinct in the region it dominates it expresses sublimely the goal of speculative thinking which is none other than to live as much as may be in the eternal and to absorb and be absorbed in the truth the rest of ancient philosophy belongs to the decadence and rests in physics on eclecticism and in morals on despair that creative breath which had stirred the founders and legislators of greece no longer inspired their descendants helpless to control the course of events they took refuge in abstention or in conformity and their ethics became a matter of private economy and sentiment no longer aspiring to mould the state or give any positive aim to existence the time was approaching when both speculation and morals were to regard the other world reason had abdicated the throne and religion after that brief interregnum resumed it for long ages side note transcendentalism true but inconsequential such are the threads which tradition puts into the hands of an observer who at the present time might attempt to knit the life of reason ideally together the problem is to unite a trustworthy conception of the conditions under which man lives with an adequate conception of his interests both conceptions fortunately lie before us heraclitus and democritus in systems easily seen to be complementary gave long ago a picture of nature such as all later observation down to our own day has done nothing but fill out and confirm 
psychology and physics still repeat their ideas often with richer detail but never with a more radical or prophetic glance nor does the transcendental philosophy in spite of its self-esteem add anything essential it was a thing taken for granted in ancient and scholastic philosophy that a being dwelling like man in the immediate whose moments are in flux needed constructive reason to interpret his experience and paint in his unstable consciousness some symbolic picture of the world to have reverted to this constructive process and studied its stages is an interesting achievement but the construction is already made by common sense and science and it was visionary insolence in the germans to propose to make that construction otherwise retrospective self-consciousness is dearly bought if it inhibits the intellect and embarrasses the inferences which in its spontaneous operation it has known perfectly how to make in the heat of scientific theorizing or dialectical argument it is sometimes salutary to be reminded that we are men thinking but after all it is no news we know that life is a dream and how should thinking be more yet the thinking must go on and the only vital question is to what practical or poetic conceptions it is able to lead us side note verbal ethics similarly the socratic philosophy affords a noble and genuine account of what goods may be realized by living modern theory has not done so much to help us here however as it has in physics it seldom occurs to modern moralists that theirs is the science of all good and the art of its attainment they think only of some set of categorical precepts or some theory of moral sentiments abstracting altogether from the ideals reigning in society in science and in art they deal with the secondary question what ought i to do without having answered the primary question what ought to be they attach morals to religion rather than to politics and this religion unhappily long ago ceased to be wisdom expressed in fancy in order to become superstition overlaid with reasoning they divide man into compartments and the less they leave in the one labelled morality the more sublime they think their morality is and sometimes pedantry and scholasticism are carried so far that nothing but an abstract sense of duty remains in the broad region which should contain all human goods Sidenote. spinoza and the life of reason such trivial sanctimony in morals is doubtless due to artificial views about the conditions of welfare the basis is laid in authority rather than in human nature and the goal in salvation rather than in happiness one great modern philosopher however was free from these preconceptions and might have reconstituted the life of reason had he had a sufficient interest in culture spinoza brought man back into nature and made him the nucleus of all moral values showing how he may recognize his environment and how he may master it but spinoza's sympathy with mankind fell short of imagination any noble political or poetical ideal eluded him everything impassioned seemed to him insane everything human necessarily petty man was to be a pious tame animal with the stars shining above his head instead of imagination spinoza cultivated mysticism which is indeed an alternative a prophet in speculation he remained a levite in sentiment little or nothing would need to be changed in his system if the life of reason in its higher ranges were to be grafted upon it but such affiliation is not necessary and it is rendered unnatural by the lack of sweep and generosity in spinoza's practical ideals side note modern and classic sources of inspiration 
for moral philosophy we are driven back then upon the ancients but not of course for moral inspiration industrialism and democracy the french revolution the renaissance and even the catholic system which in the midst of ancient illusions enshrines so much tenderness and wisdom still live in the world though forgotten by philosophers and point unmistakably toward their several goals our task is not to construct but only to interpret ideals confronting them with one another and with the conditions which for the most part they alike ignore there is no need of refuting anything for the will which is behind all ideals and behind most dogmas cannot itself be refuted but it may be enlightened and led to reconsider its intent when its satisfaction is seen to be either naturally impossible or inconsistent with better things the age of controversy is past that of interpretation has succeeded here then is the program of the following work starting with the immediate flux in which all objects and impulses are given to describe the life of reason that is to note what facts and purposes seem to be primary to show how the conception of nature and life gathers around them and to point to the ideals of thought and action which are approached by this gradual mastering of experience by reason a great task which it would be beyond the powers of a writer in this age either to execute or to conceive had not the greeks drawn for us the outlines of an ideal culture at a time when life was simpler than at present and individual intelligence more resolute and free End of introduction.